Okay, today uh, we are on Apostle Peter number 15, which is actually the 14th of the series because one is an introduction. So this is the 14th in the series. Oh no, we should be on 16. Sorry, 16. Uh, typo. Uh, so this is the 15th in the series. Uh, and I've entitled it Jesus the Hope for Healing. For our study, we'll be looking at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 onwards says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they say. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When he came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita koum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now what we are told was this, that Jesus crossed the lake, the Sea of Galilee, otherwise called or the Lake of Tiberias. He went over to the other side and a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Now what do you mean by the other side of the lake? By now you all know the Sea of Galilee very well, correct? We have been making references to it. And so what you see here is this, Jesus was in the Decapolis area, right? Where he just cast out the demon uh, called Legion. He was in a Decapolis in a Gentile area. Non-Jewish area it was not ruled by any of the Herods or connections with the Herods. But he was on the, um, on the east side of the lake. And then he went and sailed across to the other side, back to Capernaum, on the west side of the lake. So this is what is meant by he went to the other side, back to the other side. The people in the Decapolis area had just told him, please go. You know, um, you cast out these um, demons and you kill 2,000 of our pigs. We don't need a savior like that. You know, so please go home. So he left and uh, as, as, as a, perhaps a precursor, an example of the rejection that Jesus was going to face. And then he went back to the Capernaum area. And what we are told is that a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. So the people were very happy to see him back. 
It is almost like welcoming back a royalty of sorts. You know? So they all gathered around, and they were, everybody was crowding by the lake, and then the events began to unfold. The, what was unfolding? Well, we are told that a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now this was probably some kind of um, a feminine bleeding issue. It's not like she had a cut and then she had uh, a hemophilic and, and, and uh, it didn't heal. But rather it was uh, some kind of a, a feminine uh, bleeding issue that made her unclean. And that was why she was creeping around behind Jesus and didn't really quite dare to touch him and, you know, and, and, and um, wanted to just touch his garments. Okay. Now, and we are told that she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. In the other gospel accounts, in Matthew and in Luke, you don't have this emphasis. But Peter was an eyewitness to all these. Remember that. And, and the gospel of Mark is Peter's message to the people in Rome of who Jesus was and what he saw. And he said that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. So she had gone through many doctors to, to heal this chronic illness that she had. And she was a very desperate woman. She was bleeding for 12 years. Now we do not know what this bleeding was. But you can imagine, it doesn't matter what kind of bleeding. Bleeding is for 12 years is no joke at all. And so she was bleeding for 12 years. She was very desperate. She was considered unclean ceremonially unclean, socially she was unacceptable to people and it is quite likely that if she was married, she has also been divorced. You know, uh, would a husband keep her around if she's been bleeding for 12 years and ceremonially unclean? Probably not. And in those days, divorces were easy. You know, the guy just has to uh, send the woman away and she's divorced. He doesn't even have to give grounds for it. So it is most likely that if she was married, we assume that she was, that she has lost her husband. Okay. And if a person has been bleeding for 12 years, I'm also going to make another assumption that she was suffering from some kind of anemia, <laughs> losing blood, you know, for 12 years. It's absolutely terrible. And so you can understand this sense of desperation. And, and uh, Peter wants us to feel this sense of desperation that this woman has. She suffered a great deal under the care of doctors. We're going through one procedure after another. And people who are treating cancer know what it means. Suffering a great deal under the doctors, you know. Going through this procedure and that procedure and the other procedure. Sometimes guessing, sometimes knowing. Everyone trying to help. But one procedure being more difficult than the other, so she suffered terribly. And she spent all she had. Treatment costs money. 12 years. She has spent everything that she has and she's now penniless. So this poor woman not only has her health totally failed her, she's now flat broke. On top of that, instead of getting better, she just got worse. The situation just continued to deteriorate. So there is great desperation in the life of this woman. She had hoped and had been disappointed. She had hoped in one course of treatment, hoped in another course of treatment, and she had been disappointed. She had gone through treatment that was painful, embarrassing, increasingly speculative, and sometimes when people are desperate, they go to all kinds of you know, hokey-pokey treatments, and, um, and it just didn't help. Just didn't help. So here we find that um, the treatment just got worse and perhaps it was just by the natural cause of the degeneration of the disease or perhaps it was because of the treatment that she got that she actually became worse. We don't rightly know. Now, how do we, what do we make of this? I think what we can make of it is this, that sometimes when we have a problem that will not go away, especially health problems, but not necessarily limited to health problems. But when we have a problem that refuses to go away, we are first disappointed and then we despair. It is not, it's more than disappointment. You know, you recover from disappointments, but you can be disappointed so frequently that you despair of any hope. You lose hope. And we very much get a sense of where this woman was at. But when she heard about Jesus, that spark of hope came back again and she says, well, I must go to Jesus. I must go to Jesus. And so she came to Jesus in faith. 
Now this is a picture of the kingdom of God. See, if we were to look at the life of Christ, sometimes we say it is important to know that Jesus was born, Christmas. You know? It is important to know that Jesus died, that's true. But then if I were to ask you, why all that stuff in between? Why do we need to know about his healing, his casting out demons, his teaching? Wouldn't it be enough to just to record that Jesus was born and then he taught, dot dot dot, and then you know he died and rose from the dead? Well, admittedly, much of the gospel is about his death and resurrection, but there's still at least half that material about his life. In fact, Mark's gospel doesn't start with Jesus' birth at all. He started immediately with Jesus' ministry. So the gospel writers had reason why they wrote all these things. God had reason why he put all these things down for us. And when Jesus walked this earth, what did he say? He says that the king has come. The kingdom of God is in your midst. I am here and therefore the kingdom is here. So if you want to know what the kingdom of God is like, he told the disciples of John the Baptist, the lame walk, the blind see, you know, the sick are made whole again. This is what the kingdom of God is like. So we have a picture of what the kingdom of God ought to be like uh, when, when the Messiah has come. The kingdom of God is not swords and arms and shields and spears and bows and arrows, shooting and killing, but healing, restoration, um, casting out of demons, the, the sick are made whole again, the unclean are made clean. So here we see the true emphasis of the kingdom of God. Now the reality of it is this. As the world progresses in many areas, one of the areas in which we have progressed over time uh, since Christ came is the improvements in medicine. And medicine is good. We are not saying, we are not throwing it out or saying anything that is not good about it. But the reality is that there is a limit to medicine. There is a limit to what they can do and it is also limited by who can afford it. Medical treatments can get better but they also get very, very pricey. So there is really a social imbalance. If you can afford the treatment, you get it. If you cannot afford the treatment, sorry, get ready to die. <laughs> so that's basically what it is. But that is not so for the kingdom of God. This woman is penniless and she comes to Jesus. Her healing is not conditioned upon her being able to afford it. She is going to be healed through the work of the Messiah regardless of whether or not she had money. We pray earnestly, thy kingdom come, and rightly so. If we want true healing in our community, if we want to work hard for the welfare of people, then much more so we need to long for and work towards the coming of the Lord's kingdom. You know, those people who have had what they call near-death experiences, well, actually, they have actually died and come back alive again, and there are quite a few of those. And you know, most of them will tell you what? They will, they will tell you this, they will say, you know, if I had known that death was really so easy and so painless, I would never have been afraid in the first place. Um, my second uncle was one of those. He, uh, his heart stopped beating. They resuscitated him. And after that, he says, you know, I'm not afraid of dying anymore. This is not a big deal. You know, uh, it's not as, as scary as what people make it out to be. And in fact, if I had known it all along, I wouldn't have been filled with this fear and trepidation and so desperate for healing. You know, uh, and, and people are desperate for healing because they don't know what is beyond that. But, God understand our, understands our fears and so he meets us at our point of need like this, like he met this woman's uh, need. Uh, even though that healing was temporary but and beyond heaven is the resurrection. Um, after she was healed, sickness will still kill her one day but the resurrected body is incorruptible and that is really what we ought to be looking at. So the healing happened in this way. Well, She's, uh, she had thought, I must touch his clothes and I will be healed. There was a belief or superstition in that time that when a person is powerful, the, the power animates through his clothes and it comes out through his clothes. So she had this kind of um, wrong belief about Jesus Christ and said that, well, if I touch his clothes, I will get well. But she touched his clothes and she did get well. So how do we understand from this? You see, some people look at an event like this and say, therefore, the theology that we must have is this. You know, if you are a man of God, somebody touches your clothes, you, they will get well. Did God heal her because she got it right? Or did God heal her in spite of her getting it wrong? And I think we must understand that this is quite a 
unusual, unique situation, and God healed her in spite of her not getting it right. Another thing is this, another thing why, why uh, Peter brought it out to us is that she was unclean. She was ceremonially unclean. And because she was unclean, she didn't quite, really quite dare to touch Jesus because she was not supposed to touch people. You know, and he's a holy man, a rabbi, and I cannot really touch him. And yet Jesus was never afraid to touch the unclean because the unclean never made him unclean. He, the clean, made the unclean clean. So here we find that um, um, although she didn't dare to touch Jesus because she was unclean, she only touched his clothes, yet she got well. And the other thing, of course, is that she comes to Jesus penniless. She has nothing to contribute to Jesus' ministry. Now in today's world, you will hear sometimes Christians, perhaps well-meaning, I don't know, saying things like, you know, if you have faith in God, you must demonstrate your faith by giving a donation. And you prove your faith in God by giving a donation. And then when you give that money, it proves your faith in God and then God will heal you. Right? You hear it uh, quite often. Every now and then you'll hear things like that. Well, if you had told that woman that she's in for trouble. Because she had nothing to give. She had nothing to give for her healing. She had no, no monetary means to express her faith. And Jesus never asked for monetary means to express faith. Not once, not here, not at any point in time. Healing was always given freely. It was never conditioned on some kind of a donation. Okay? And here you have one typical example of what we should not be emphasizing. Okay? Um, of course, there are reasons to give and good reasons, but it is not an exchange. You know, it is almost like a very bad deal for God. You know, the preacher says, if you trust in God, you must, you must, um, pull out of your pocket and give what you have, and then it shows your faith, and then God will heal you. You know, you're expressing your faith. So guess what? Who keeps the money? The preacher keeps the money. Who is straddled with the responsibility of healing? God is straddled with the responsibility. Good deal, right? I also like deals like that, you know. But unfortunately, as a minister of the gospel, I cannot preach deals like that, you know, where I keep the money and God gets to do the job. Okay, uh, But Jesus wasn't like that. People came to him penniless and he healed them. There was no condition of proving your faith by giving money. Okay, um, so I think it is a wrong implication to look at this situation and say that, you know, um, you know, that you must do this or that to, to touch the clothes of the garment, but it was ultimately her faith that mattered. We are told that immediately her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was being freed from her suffering. See, her faith was mixed with superstition, and yet it was honoured. And many times that's true with us. Can you imagine if God were to judge us in this way, you know, um, if God were to tell me, you know, Peter, until you get all your theology right, I'm not going to listen to your prayers. Why, that's going to be really tough, right? You know, who, who among us can get absolutely everything, get all the dots correct, get all the crossing of the T's correct? And if God makes that a condition, then who is he ever going to listen to? So I think we must understand that even for people with imperfect faith, God is going to listen. Even if we don't get everything right in our conception, God is going to listen. So it is not because God is listening to us because of our mistakes. It's God listening to us in spite of our mistakes. right? And, and so I think we must see the largeness of God. And of course, the devil is a very sly creature, right? So instead of looking at the bigness of God and the generosity of God, answering us in spite of our superstition, answering us in spite of our misconceptions, what does he do? He takes these misconceptions that we have and says, this is the reason why God is answering you. And then we begin to emphasize on exactly the things that we shouldn't be emphasizing on. We should be emphasizing on the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the abundance of God. And instead we, all, we, we emphasize on, you know, I noticed that when I prayed nine times, on the ninth time, God answered me. So you must pray nine times in a row, then God will hear you. Duh! You know? You see, so we, we, we go and emphasize all the wrong things in life. God hears us in spite of all our superstitions and not because of them. Okay. There are people who pray once, there are people who pray 90 times. Okay. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it is one time, nine times or 90 times. But God hears us because He's good, not because we got our method right. 
Okay, so this woman didn't quite get her method right, but God still honored her. God still honored her. <clears throat> now we need to understand on her part, it was her faith that healed her, and not so much the other things. So when Jesus Christ uh, commanded her later on and said that you know, daughter, your faith has healed you, he's not saying that you know it is your faith that has caused you to be whole, uh, to be whole again, but that he's telling her it is not the touching the garment and all this kind of stuff. In fact, if she had said that, um, I believe that if I touch the ground where he walked, I will be healed. So after Jesus walks, she touches the ground, she is also going to be healed. You know. So it's in spite of, of her beliefs that she's being healed. Okay, and, um, and that is the point that is being brought across there. Then we are told that Jesus felt something. Power had gone out from him. Now, this is actually one of the very rare glimpses we have of what happens to Jesus when in his healing ministry. That he actually felt something draining out. You know, it's almost like a battery being discharged. You know, he was feeling some power coming to him. He says, um, uh, he says that, and, and then he, he, he lost it. Somebody, uh, was healed. Somebody, um, had, sucked it out of him almost. And he's saying, who, who, who? Okay. Um, now this woman was hoping to be anonymous. I touch him, I get healed and goodbye. No, nobody knows, right? She was trying to sort of slink away. But Jesus wasn't going to allow that. He's saying, no, I I'm going to draw you out. M my relationship with you is not limited to healing. The relationship is much more than that. So he looked around and he was absolutely determined. You know, the disciples says, everybody is crowding around you. You say, who touched me? You know, and of course, you know, who was that? Who asked that question? It was Peter who asked it. We know that in Luke's gospel, that Peter was the one who asked, you know, uh, that question, you know, master, you know, uh, excuse me, a lot of people are touching you. So uh, how, how am I going to say who touched uh, you? But, um, the disciples were too dumb. Jesus didn't explain. You know, it's too hard to explain to you guys. So he was just looking around to see who was the one. And then the woman realized, I, I know it is me. Okay. So she came to Jesus, trembling, fell at his feet, and, and, and then, uh, admitted that she was the one who did so. Okay. Um, now, Jesus was not seeking her out to rebuke her. Jesus wasn't seeking her out to say, why did you touch me without my permission? Or, uh, or why didn't you ask me properly? Or anything of that sort. But rather, he was, to go, he was making contact with her and trying to complete the work that has already started. Too many people use God as a super healer and want to leave it there. And in this regard, you know, we must be reminded that the prayer ministry that we have is, is a, must be a complete ministry. Like Jesus wanted to complete that work with a woman. Some people say, I pray and then God answered my prayer, I'm here now. Okay, goodbye. And that is not the point of the healing ministry. That is not the point of the prayer ministry. That the, the, the relationship we have with God must be completed. It might start with the healing. And many people are healed, and because they are healed, they come and seek the Lord, and that is the right process. But there are some who are healed, and then they just sort of, thank you, goodbye, good luck, see you next time when I'm sick again. You know. Well, Jesus wants to draw us into a commitment with Him. There is a cost to healing, and Jesus explains it to us. He says, power went out from me. I knew something happened. Okay. And in the same way, when we pray for people, power goes out from you. Energy goes out from you. Am I correct to say that? When you pray for someone, when you fast for someone, you know, I was um, training my running and, and every time I'm fasting and praying, I cannot fast and pray and train at the same time. Okay. You cannot be running over 10 kilometers and be fasting while doing it. Okay. So, um, so, so I have to choose. Does it come at a cost to me? Yes. You know, um, does it come at a cost of comfort, discomfort and all that? It does. Because praying for someone, earnestly pouring your heart out for someone, costs you something. Costs you your passion, your emotion, your energy. It, it causes you to have to put other things aside in order to do this. And so if a person comes to Christ with the attitude, all I want is healing. Well, we are told here, Jesus wants to draw them out and to complete their healing process. Because their healing is not complete until it is total. So the physical healing must be accompanied by spiritual healing. So he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. 
Jesus rarely, rarely uses this word daughter in, in what we have recorded for us. But it's a very tender term, daughter. My, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So here we have Jesus saying a kindly word to her and the role of faith uh, was brought to completion when Jesus addressed her and spoke to her. Faith was a vital component and the Bible tells us elsewhere without faith it is impossible to please God. But in the very next story, and these two events happen uh, concurrently, in the very next story you will find that faith had nothing to do with her healing because the girl was dead. Dead people cannot have faith. So you have two contrasting stories right in the same passage. In this one story in which Jesus said, your faith has made you whole, in the other event, she had no faith at all because she was dead. Perhaps the parents had faith, but it was kind of a wobbly faith. You know? so, so when we hear a statement like, your faith has made you whole, it does not mean that faith is going to be the thing that is going to do the job. But in the case of the woman, it is your faith and not your superstition. It is your faith and not your other conceptions that is going to make you whole. 